What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Brutally Speaking Podcast, the official podcast of MetalNexus.net, where you can get all your show reviews, concert reviews, and so much more. And uh, I'm flying solo on this episode. Uh, this episode's guest is Vinny Beetle. He is a comedian. He is a uh, booker of comedians and so forth. And uh, this is a, an interesting conversation. So a few months ago, uh, we did an episode with Alfonso Seville of Heartsick, but uh, kind of told the story of how he was involved in the inner workings of the Il Nino kind of fiasco, uh, where he was going to be the new vocalist, and then Dave kind of fucked everything up and lied to him and kind of was pitting Alfonso against other friends in the band and so forth. And so this is kind of the same scenario, but a completely different facet uh, and realm of everything. Uh, Vinny and I met when I went to the Astronomicon earlier this year uh, in February. Um, as luck would have it, I happened to be at the the desk to figure out where the con was if I if they had a shuttle that would take me and Vinny was waiting to to get his room keys and so forth to hurry up get in and go to the con himself uh we quickly were talking and as it ended up turning out he was saying that he was there for an event uh, with Bam Margera and we just kind of quickly you know exchanged some business cards and so forth and uh I think we saw each other at the con maybe once uh in passing uh it was just one of those things like you know we quickly exchanged uh, like I said some business cards and we followed each other online and you know we talked about doing a podcast just you know I, I wanted to start getting some comedians on and so forth and you know didn't think too much of it when it didn't happen that night like it was supposed to uh as you'll hear you'll find out why that didn't happen that night uh the interview with with him in our hotel lobby uh um, but it's one of those things where I had made a comment on Facebook a while ago, uh, my personal page, and it was basically something to the effect of like, never turn down an opportunity to, to network because you never know how that networking opportunity might arise and present itself further on down the road. And now, you know, a lot of people might have been like, oh, a comedian, you know, I'm more in the rock metal music podcast thing and just kind of blown Vinny off. Um, and I definitely would say, you know, like I was trying to, to do an interview with Bam. He was one of the people I wanted to have an interview with at the con. It almost worked, and then it d didn't pan out. Uh, and it was just one of those things that uh, was kind of like, ah, it probably won't happen. But then as as it would happen, you know, I saw Vinny, you know, through following each other on social media, I saw he was looking to bring some of this, this BAM Q&A, you know, live show thing uh, and tour with it a little bit more. And so I know that the show in Detroit had, you know, sold out like a 400 cap room or so uh, in advance. So at that point, I kind of saw there was an opportunity to maybe help get something going. As I have said many times on this podcast, I used to book shows and is one of those things that I do have connections to people who are in different realms of things and also have other connections to other rooms around, you know, the Midwest area. So it was one of those things, like, I hit up Vinny and was like, yo, man, if you need help, like, getting any of these shows, like, in the Midwest or getting shows in the Midwest, like, let me know. I'd be willing to help. And it was just more or less just trying to be, you know, helpful. Um, now, it is one of those things when I reached out and found a person that is someone here that's, you know, down in the Grand Rapids, Muskegon, Kalamazoo, you know, area of Michigan it was one of those things like this This person has been putting on, uh, Don Veltman has been putting on a lot of great shows over in Muskegon and, you know, gets, you know, Steve-O has been uh, someone that has performed at the Comedy Club. Uh, you know, he has had Rob Schneider, you know, Tim Meadows, like, you know, a lot of great, you know, comedians of, of the past and present and so forth. And, you know, he's just trying to build a, a great comedy scene here in this area. And so I was like, you know, this is a really great opportunity to maybe kind of do something a little bit bigger. Like if Steve-O can go and, and do well and draw well, then I don't see why Bam couldn't. And so I helped him get some shows set up. And um, and then basically the whole fucking thing blew up. Um, Bam obviously had some uh, issues uh, to deal with personally, ended up going to rehab after some very... Oh, God, just very hard to watch <laughs> Instagram videos and so forth. Um, I think Bam's struggles have been well documented. Uh, there's a reality show he was on that kind of dealt with a lot of these things. So if you don't know what we're talking about, I guess go Google very quickly. Um, but Vinny was kind of at the epicenter of the, all of this, you know, be, for me as my, my tie to Bam. And, you know, I, I kind of make mention that I have friends who worked on the Fuckface Unstoppable tours and a friend of friend's band that toured with uh, Bam on one of those runs. So I, I've kind of heard the stories. And so when everything kind of fell by the wayside, I, I wasn't insanely shocked. And it's actually one of the reasons why I didn't take on the show myself financially, just because I, I figured there wasn't much of a return of investment <laughs> opportunity at that point. And to be completely honest, I just straight up didn't have the money. But it is one of those things where 
Vinny and I have kind of weaved in and out of each other's lives uh, over the last, you know, six to eight months uh, with all of this stuff. So to see how basically Vinny and Bam are kind of going at it at each other over money that is missing or whatever was uh, kind of interesting because I feel like I had a part of his story to help him tell because I was involved in part of this, whether it be, you know, seeing how the shows were getting booked. Uh, the process of all that, talking with Don once the show was booked and, you know, kind of just like, oh, how how was that? You know, was it hard? You know, what went into it? Because, you know, comedy booking is in the realm of, of booking shows that I'm familiar with. So it was just kind of curious to see how similar it is to booking bands and so forth. Uh, so it was definitely one of those things where I felt like, you know, there's been a lot of shit going on in the last week or so with Vinny. He's resurfaced and, and it's, it's a lot of... It's been a lot of finger pointing between Bam being like, Vinny stole all this money, and Vinny being like, no, it's your manager, and like all this other shit. And like, I was just like, yo, dude, like, this is what a podcast is for. Come on, tell your story, tell it in long form, unedited, and just get your side out there. But something that I realized in listening to one of the other podcasts he had done on the Lone Shark podcast is that everyone was so focused on just kind of getting to the point of like, where are you at now? Who's to blame? And you know, it, it, I know that this world is built on drama. Like, if you can find something sensationalized within drama, that's what people want. They're gravitated toward it. Whereas I just kind of realized that was like, well, you've worked with, you know, TJ Miller, who has had some issues publicly. Uh, you've worked with Artie Lang, who has had a long, very long <laughs> past uh, with a lot of things, uh, drug, alcohol abuse, and, and so on and so forth, uh, squandered opportunities that he may have had. And so I just kind of saw a pattern potentially uh, in Vinny that he likes to maybe try to work with people that maybe he feels – not that he can take advantage of, but that he can – steer in the right direction and kind of get the ship back on course and you know as someone who kind of does that myself I feel like I, I identify a lot with that because I see the good in everybody and I want everyone to be happy and sometimes you learn that you can't save everybody and that's just the unfortunate thing of where it is and I think Vinny has a really interesting story to tell so what we're going to do is we're going to kind of do this in a couple of different parts so this first part is kind of getting to know Vinny getting to know his background in comedy how he got to work with TJ Miller how he got to work with Artie Lang some of the experiences of working with both of them and then a little bit about working with Bam leading up to the Detroit date which is where we met at the Astronomicon so this is a longer chat I didn't edit it all I did was just mix the levels so you're hearing the conversation exactly how it is supposed to be and I think that's exactly how Vinny would want it so without further ado this is my conversation with Vinny Beetle and we're not gonna do an outro this is just going to end as soon as the episode's done, and there will be a part two that we are going to probably record in the next couple of days, so look out for that, and uh, let me know what you thought of this. Leave the comment. Hell, fucking Vinny left his phone number, so give him a call. Let him know what you think. I'm interested to, to hear the rest of this story, and I'm interested to see how this progresses, so once again, this is my conversation with Vinny Beetle, and talk to you all next time. <laughs> So I had the pleasure this uh, early morning of talking to Vinny Beetle, who is a comedian, a event planner, and uh, I think just all around the uh, most hated person on the internet, I think, if uh, Instagram and all these other sites are to be believed. How are you doing this morning? I feel very hated. How are you? Uh, I mean, I think outside of Kawhi Leonard right now, you might be the most hated person in uh, North America. <laughs> possible but i'm not really sure how canadians feel about bam or me so i don't know how i fit in that realm but yeah it's crazy about Kawhi. yeah no it's uh that's been the big news i mean it was the earthquake and then basically i think that was just Kawhi, like making the announcement was what caused like this huge uh six point was a 6.6 .6, uh seismic uh earthquake over in the west coast <laughs> yeah it might have just been lebron falling over or something and, and <laughs> snapping his head against the floor. but uh 
I know a lot of people maybe aren't big into sports, so we'll kind of stop talking about the big earth-shattering news that happened in the NBA and the free agency basically being over now. Um, but all that aside, uh, you and I have a little bit of a history that has kind of morphed into some some interesting things since uh, we have kind of come into each other's lives, uh, starting at the Astronomicon this past uh, year in Detroit uh, with an event you were doing with BAM, and BAM being a featured uh, person that was at the event. Uh, but... You know, there's. I always like kind of doing a deeper dive with people uh, where there is one. And for those that may not know, like you have worked with people such as Artie Lang and uh, T.J. Miller, uh, like the Deadpool and uh, Silicon Valley uh, shows and movies and so forth, as well as being a comedian. And you know, being a comedian yourself. So I kind of before we get into the shitstorm of everything that has happened in the last, uh, I'd say, a couple of months, uh, working with Bam and his manager and all the people associated with him, uh, I kind of want to get to know more about. How did you get into comedy? And then I guess more, how did you parlay it into kind of being a, a manager and or, you know, like a booking talent agent of sorts uh, for some of these high-end clients that you have amassed? Well, so when I was 17 years old, um, my mother's brother had gone to federal prison for some crimes related to, you know, per, uh, drug sales and different things like that. And I just didn't know. I was working at his car dealership at the time and it got closed down and I didn't really know what to do next. I had already left, you know, pretty much only gone to high school one or two days a week at that point, pretty much was leaving high school to work in the car business. And I just was like, I want to find something for me, uh, for my future. And I had actually talked to a guy at the dealership that owned a comedy club in New Haven and said, you know, he had seen me make some customers laugh and he was just like, kid, you're way too young to be in, in this garage. Why don't you, come to the comedy club. So the first time I ever walked into this comedy club in New Haven, Joker's Wild, I just kind of felt like it was a place I wanted to be. I didn't really know how to go about being a comedian. So I talked to a guy that manages a club there. His name's Pat. And he kind of just, I took a class and he helped show me the ropes a little bit. And, you know, I was a teenager, so I wasn't allowed there when they were selling alcohol at night. If they made an exception and let me come down for the open mic night. And so I invited a ton of my friends down and, you know, the place only fit a couple hundred people at the most. If you jammed everybody in, some people were standing and I, on a open, regular open mic night, I got all my friends and family to come down. And, you know, of course the business is making money. So they were excited and you could see they were excited to have me there and do that again. And that's when I immediately thought that, you know, there was a business behind it. And at 17, I was like, well, I could start to, you know, promote shows. And, and I did that for a long time. I did that for like seven years where, of course, your family and friends after a while stopped coming to shows. But then we found ways to promote and get other people, you know, to come, like whether we would go to tourist vacation areas or beach spots and just get out and sell tickets to strangers or if we were in New York City doing that. We just found where the people were and started a business uh, called Traveling Nomads, which basically was a bunch of comedians who went anywhere we believed that we can get a crowd, whether we were in Tennessee or whether we were on the Jersey Shore or in Atlantic City or something like that. Um, and so that developed over that time until I got an opportunity to work alongside a guy who owns a big uh, comedy club in the New Jersey, Connecticut area. And they bring in celebrities every weekend. And that's when I started to see that that's, that's a big way that people actually come out of their house on the weekends is to see people that they know from movies and television, not necessarily like local acts, you know. And so that was really the beginning into the first like eight years. And these last couple of years, I've, uh, you know, stepped into the world of trying to find the people that I enjoyed growing up watching and trying to connect with them and put on some events that I just believed would, you know, obviously create more revenue for my business, but just the shows would be bigger and better. And, you know, I was, I was pretty lucky and able to do that. So how does, you know, what's always interesting sometimes in, you know, we were talking a little bit about this before, you know, we were recording, but, you know, I, I kind of talk about how a lot of people don't know that or assume that I know as much as I do about, we'll say, sports or as old going way back into like the 80s and so forth with sports or music that predates when I was around and alive. And so, you know, sometimes some of the people you've worked with, like I'll, I'll kind of go back to Artie, you know, 
Howard Stern is a very large looming presence uh, for a lot of things. Some would even say he's kind of the the pre preemptive uh, podcaster of sorts. You know, the, the way he kind of did interviews and long form interviews on a on a platform like he did, and then going to kind of serious and all that kind of stuff. But you know, it it just kind of seems like Artie is kind of one of those people that someone at your age may not have been aware of who he was as, as more of as a comedian because at the time of when he kind of came to prominence he was just kind of that guy on on howard that would say kind of really wild inappropriate shits <laughs> well so that's the only reason that i even brought up my family's past before i got into comedy is that i was raised in this italian family that fought in the footsteps of their fathers and their fathers and even though those long days are gone where Italians did organized crime. My family still happened to try to stay in it. And I've just had a lot of experience with drug addicts in my life. And when I had heard Artie for the first time, I was 14 years old and a friend of mine, his name is Frank. His dad listened to Howard Stern every day. And this kid, Frank, you know, we and him hung out all the time. We were best friends for years and he wanted to get into comedy with me and he just didn't. And I did but he was the guy who knew every fact about every comedian. You know, we liked Sandler and Farley. And that's the other thing we like Farley in, in the SNL days. And when you like Farley, you come to find that him and Artie have the similar fan base sort of. It's almost as if, uh, it's almost as if if Farley started to do stand up in his hardcore drug days and was alive, then that would be kind of a, a form of what Artie does, you know, um, <laughs> in a way. But I had worked on opening this, a uh, club for nomads that was actually at uh, arcade with a big banquet hall called nomads in Connecticut. And that's where we originally adopted the name from. And we wanted to bring in, we were doing these smaller shows like I had been doing and it was working out really well. It's a family entertainment center. And for the adults at night, they'd be able to leave their kids in the arcade and watch the show. And so I ended up, uh, you know, a lot of people believe in, visualization and positively reinforcing your, you know, your thoughts into action. And I'm a big fan of HBO's crashing. Um, I kind of, if you think, if you look at how Pete Holmes's career started, where he was passing out flyers on the street, I was doing a similar thing. We were trying to make money selling tickets, but you know, it was like the same kind of gist of how you get brought into comedy is very real to me. And of course I love Judd Apatow and I read his book. So, you know, when I started watching crashing TJ Miller immediately was a guy who I had, you know, loved growing up. And so I just tweeted at him one day. I seen he was at Bananas in New Jersey every day, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, but they didn't have a show on Sunday for him. And it was Tuesday of that same week in August of 2018. And I said to myself, well, if TJ has no show on Sunday, maybe I could contact somebody you know. So I tried all these people, some people in the family, just whoever I thought, you know, in the comedy world, that I'd be able to get in touch with them. And I ended up getting in touch with him through his opening act send him a message that, Hey, if he wants to do the show, tell him to call me. And so I ended up getting a message on Facebook while I was at, coincidentally playing NBA live with LeBron James, just scoring a million points. <laughs> and I don't even do it. I don't even do it. Like online. I just play the computer on easy just to make myself feel good. But <laughs> and so Sunday, I see like a notification. that says from TJ Miller. And he said, Hey man, is this show really possible? And he gave me his number and I called him and he said, look, I don't usually work for just, you know, comedians, you know, and kids uh, that are that are younger in the game that he goes, but uh, for some reason I feel as though, you know, this this might work out. And if and and actually his opening act, coincidentally, his family was born and raised in South Windsor, Connecticut, and that's where the club is. You know, so I guess it was a good way for him to go see his family. The opening act, and TJ likes to kind of live the life of a road comic, so he was going to like sleep on the guy's mom's couch, like just kind of like you know, tough it out for the night. And he was like excited about that. But I only had five days to put the show together and TJ didn't put it out on his social media at all because he had other gigs coming up and around Connecticut and they, and his, you know, his lawyers and his agents and everybody was contacting me to cancel the show, other clubs. And in five days, just by spreading the word by myself, the guy's so popular, we sold, you know, almost 200 tickets at $30 in just five days. And when he showed up, we had a great show. Our energy was there. He really liked my set. And obviously, him and his opening act were amazing. I gave some other comedians opportunity. And after that, you know, TJ said, you know, he really wanted to work with me more and that we were. But, you know, he's had his his personal family dealings. Somebody in his family has been sick. And he told me he'd have to take some time off of 
working on side projects because between his main tour and his family and spending this time with them, it's been tough. He's even had to cancel some other shows and he canceled one with me, which kind of set us back financially, which was my first lesson. You would think that, you know, maybe messing with these guys isn't the best idea because if you don't have all the money or you have investors in your business and they're going to lose their money, it's a serious thing, you know? So after TJ canceled the show, I dabbled with working with some others, but I had uh, talked to the Reverend Bob Levy from the Howard Stern show about the availability of Artie Lang, because when I worked in Atlantic City selling tickets, they had Artie down there. I had known people that knew Bob, and I called Bob, and he said it was possible. It was expensive. It was a lot more expensive than working with TJ. I mean, TJ let me make more money than he did that night. It wasn't about the money for TJ. TJ is an artist, and he loves to be in different places and environments, and he's all about his art, and that dude is definitely the, the best comedian I've ever worked with. Um, not a lot, everybody always says bad things about TJ, but I'm telling you, he's always treated me really good. I mean, to give him a deposit, I drove $1,000 to Manhattan to meet him from Connecticut, and when I got there... He had closed off an entire Japanese barbecue restaurant and I walk in and it was just him at a table full of food and he must have spent more on that lunch than I even paid him. <laughs> so he's, he, you know, he's a good guy and, but you know, he, he had some things he had to handle and I it was tough, man. It was tough for a kid just starting a business to have to cancel a sold out show with TJ Miller. Um, but I, I ended up getting in touch with Artie and Artie was in a different situation in life and people always say, well, Vinny <laughs> must have been enabling or manipulating Artie to do this show with his drug habits. And Artie's been an addict for longer than my life, you know? So you're never not an addict once you are, and you have to want to help yourself to help yourself. So, you know, Artie's going to get high regardless who he works with. He could work with Vinny Beetle. He could work with Sam Margera. He could work with nobody and he'll still be able to do what he wants to do. And that's just who Artie is. But I had always been very real with Artie, and the first weekend that he came, he did two shows at my club in September, and people said he wasn't going to show up, uh, but he did. Uh, he did show up, and he showed up both nights, and he was paid very well. He was paid $6,000 for both nights, him and Bob, and they sold the rooms out, and, uh, you know, it was great. And after that, you know, you started to experience Artie a bit through Bob going to rehab and, and Artie getting help. They canceled four or five shows on me that I, that Bob had told me I can book. And so after that, I got in touch with Artie, who at the time had a new manager. Bob wasn't booking his shows anymore. And we had one show in Amityville, New York, and the guy told me it was the next day. And, and without Artie posting it on social media, we sold about 100 tickets at 40 and $6 each. So it was a good show. And, you know, his manager told me we needed to guarantee Artie $5,000 or he wasn't going to come. Now this was like a Thursday night, you know, it wasn't much going on and Artie had already committed to me that they would do it. And I'd already canceled five and I couldn't cancel this six. I couldn't afford it. And so I ended up getting on the phone with Artie himself through a friend and Artie had just told me that he doesn't want to see me get screwed for any more money and to come pick him up myself and he'll do it, you know, for whatever I can give him. And so I ended up, paying him $2,500 that night. Cause that's what we could afford with the other comedians and myself making a few hundred hours and already did it. And he enjoyed himself with me and Andre Kim is a comedian in New York. He's the co-host of Godfrey's podcast and Godfrey. We trust from the movie and whatnot. And Andre is a great kid. And, and me and Andre just said, Hey man, let's, let's put these shows together for Bob and Artie. And even if it's just Artie and we'll kind of take him around and make sure he gets there on time. And so we did. We did shows in uh, Connecticut, sold out theater, 300 people. We did Yonkers, New York. Um, and we had, we had started to get some buzz. And uh, unfortunately, we were, you know, we were doing well. And I never seen Artie do any drugs, but I know he went home immediately right after the show. So knowing he has a problem, obviously, he just liked being in the comfort of his own home, you know, and he would just go home immediately no matter where we were right after he was off stage, but he showed up upwards to an hour early for every show. And, you know, yeah, he didn't look very good, but I, I mean, he didn't look good when I met him. So I just, um, he's always been very nice to me. And I, I understand that you can't force anybody. So who am I to say, you know, Artie, you shouldn't do these shows. The fans still love to see him. They laughed, they took pictures with him. And it seemed to be the only thing that kept him not in his depression, you know, was getting on stage and letting it out. 
so I wanted to help him do that. And I also wanted to further what I was doing. And, and uh, you know, it sucks. You know, it sucks the way it turned out because we just brought him to court one morning and he tested positive and they put him into a drug court program. And he's been bat- bouncing back and forth between that and jail for, you know, six months now, rehabs and halfway houses and jail. And he just seems to can't, he can't get out of the system. But after that, it just got a little bit shaky, you know, as it always does. Whenever a celebrity goes to rehab, it gets shaky with their family because they start to worry about their loved one and they don't know who's genuine or who isn't. And I've experienced that both with Artie's family and with Bam's family. And, and it's because I've gotten close with them. And uh, I just wish they can hear that. It's not that I want them to not be better. It's just that they have to really want it. And if they believe that a big part of, you know, them getting clean is changing your people, places and things. Well, then it's not just Vinny Beetle that has to not be around these people. It's everybody, you know, and these celebrities, it's hard for them to walk away. It's hard for them to walk down the street without getting recognized. I mean, Artie was working as a gas station attendant in rehab, and and somebody must have brought him some some drugs from the gas station or something. It's the only way he could have came up positive and went back to jail. Um, And, you know, so that's it's been a really difficult road as far as that. I mean, Artie, of course, man, every celebrity you work with, they want to promise you the world as far as who they're going to introduce you to and what they're going to, you know, do for your career and this and that. But I always just tried to stay focused on the now. I knew everything was short term and I just wanted to have a good show every time we did it. So I had some memories with people that I loved to watch growing up. And we did every show that I've done with these celebrities that we've actually done the show. We've done really well, but because they have their substance abuse issues, it seems that it's a 50, 50 shot, whether we're going to do the show or not. And that's where it, it, it becomes, you know, very difficult to, do that. The show we canceled with Artie was at Westside Comedy Club in New York City, and that's the same place that Bam punched his manager in the face, and we canceled two shows in one night. So you could see how this is extremely damaging my reputation. And it's obviously, as a man, I got to accept and and face that these are the decisions I made is to try to work with these people. Um, But there is a certain illusion that comes along with a kid that's trying to make it in this business and and what the actual reality of what the business is, especially with your heroes. Um, and I don't want to say they're my heroes, but just, you know, in general, anybody who says, Oh my God, Artie Lang or Bam or, you know, um, so, you know, it's tough, you know, kind of speaking a little bit to working with TJ and we'll, we'll focus on Artie as well. You know, after you deal with what you did with TJ, which I understand is a completely different set of circumstances than dealing with Artie who comes with, you know, decades long of baggage. You know, I understand trying to, cause I hear a lot of similarities of when I was trying to book shows and, you know, and I was getting, getting like smaller bands on labels and so forth, but then starting to get bands that had a name and bands that people, like I didn't really have to push as hard. It'd be like, okay, this band announces their tour. It gets promoted on various websites and so forth. And people know that it's coming there. So they're buying tickets cause they're excited and getting to that level was really cool but it also becomes with a lot of pressures of like okay now there's more expectations like you know like you know you have food budgets you have per diems you have you know different things on a rider that you're responsible for like and it was just like ridiculous to kind of like see how much like hoops I had to jump through just to get a show to happen and kind of seeing some of the I'll just say the realities of the business side of that like really become kind of daunting especially when you're just an up-and-coming person and you're just trying to do cool shit for your your local area well the definitely comes per like a per case basis like with tj had you know somebody close in his family not gotten very sick um you know when we had that lunch in manhattan it was 45 minutes of him listening to my ideas which when he told me he would listen to some of my ideas i had said to myself well this guy is uh you know a millionaire and an a-list movie star so he doesn't need my ideas he must just be curious as to who i am and what i'm about you know And so I had just told him things about wanting to produce shows on my own. And he had mentioned that somebody that he had came up with in Chicago that originally made him a headliner had just passed away. And he felt like that he had to pay it forward to somebody. So he had, he had really been paying like a spiritual debt to somebody else. And he had chose me to help me. And it was just an unfortunate thing. He was the easiest dude I ever dealt with. Um, When we got to the show, uh, he only asked, 
last minute for my wife to go get some kale chips for him at Whole Foods. <laughs> he just didn't <laughs> want to eat anything that was there. And besides that, man, he didn't ask for a damn thing. Actually, at the end, his opening act got a little too drunk and he didn't want to be around him. So TJ paid for his own lift back to New York City. So like I said, he probably lost money himself working with me just from the standpoint that he was trying to help me out. Um, and, and I went about it the wrong way when I panicked after he canceled the first show, I had contacted him like, Hey man, you just assume a millionaire is going to be able to pay five or 10 grand of your, you know, your bullshit. If, if a show fucks up, but he said, Vinny, you know, I kind of did you a favor coming in the first place, which he did because your resume builds, you know, and, and sadly, the one thing that I don't really talk about a lot is, is what made me believe that I can work with these guys. And it, it was when I was working in Atlantic city. And I was selling tickets on a boardwalk and I was performing at Caesars every night. And it was just great tourists every day. You're making money, uh, putting food on the table for my family. And, and it was just, a, it was a fun little lifestyle for a couple of years. And you know, the funny, the funny thing about it is I got a call from the same uncle that, that went to jail when I was 17. And obviously he only went for a little bit of time and he's out. And he says to me, uh, Vinny, my best friend, Jimmy Barone, he, um, lost both of his legs to diabetes. And, and this is before I met TJ and Artie and everything. And he said that, uh, Adam Sandler was looking for somebody for one of his feature films that coincidentally needed to have no legs. And they heard about Jimmy's story and they flew in and talked to him and they put him on the movie. And I thought my uncle was seriously busting my balls and I did not want to leave the situation I was in. So I basically hung up on him. Well, a couple months go by and they shoot the movie and when I get home, I get another call from my uncle, and I'm in Connecticut, and he says, Vinny, you have to come to Jimmy's. They need somebody to be his assistant. And I ended up for a couple months working as Jimmy's assistant in the post-production and on set, and I, I got it. we got invited to the, the movie premiere, me and my wife, and we got to meet David Spade and Chris Rock and Steve Buscemi and Rob Schneider and, and everybody that's around Adam Sandler. I got to meet Adam and just experience what it's like to be behind the scenes of a movie and meet everybody. And unfortunately, Jimmy uh, used the money that he got from the movie to abuse alcohol and heroin. And he ended up dying a few months later. Um, and the movie's the week of, if you, if you watch on Netflix with Chris Rock and Adam Sandler, he's one of the main characters throughout. He's in the movie with no legs, you know? And, and so Adam was very, very nice to me after it happened. He texted me that he felt sorry and whatnot, but it's just a sad story to see what Hollywood could do to even regular people that they get a little taste of 60 or 70 grand. And, uh, you know, they didn't know Jimmy had a drug problem. I don't know if they knew that. I don't know if they tried to get him help. I don't know if they don't care about that stuff, you know? And so it, it but it didn't open my eyes until after I started working with Artie because I had seen such similarities in their habits. And I didn't want to see Artie die, you know, and that was the one thing that was worrying me all the time is that I didn't want to go through this loss again because I was one of the last people to say goodbye to Jimmy. And I got Jimmy into stand up. He'd obviously be sitting down in his wheelchair, but we got some fitted f footage of him making some people laugh in Connecticut. And I just really tried to help the guy. And, and obviously, you know, Adam loved him and said he would have put him in other movies and whatnot. And you know, they didn't, you know, Jimmy was embarrassed to tell them about his living, living in a hotel and being addicted to heroin and booze. And, you know, an addiction is, if anything, anybody should learn from any of what we talk about is that addiction is damaging, whether you are a poor person on the street or whether you are the biggest star in Hollywood, because we're all human people. And, you know, when you deal with drugs like that, man, you're just dancing with the devil every single time, you know, and the only thing I've really ever gotten into was weed for a very long time in my life. And even that, you know, gives me tons of anxiety that probably wouldn't be there if I didn't smoke it. Uh, but it seems to be the only thing to bring me down when Bam sends two millions of his fans after me. Um, you know, so yeah, man, that's, that's it. So after Jimmy, I, I, I knew that, my dreams were in reach after meeting Adam Sandler, who to me was my ultimate hero growing up. I knew that at some level there were people out there if he's reachable that were even more reachable. And that's what made me get into, you know, having the balls to text TJ, having the balls to call Bob and try to book Artie and, and even ask Artie if I could be his manager for a few months and Artie let me, you know, do that and book these shows. And, um, you know, so as soon as Artie goes, you know, away, that, that's what really leads into what's next, which is me working with Bam Margera. Something, you know, I'm kind of thinking about, 
in relation to everything, but kind of hearing more of the, the backstory before we even get to you dealing with Bam, do you think, you know, because everyone, the narrative is of you that you take people, take advantage of people who are, who are weak due to their addictions, where I'm kind of wondering if maybe it's the something that no one is focusing on and maybe that you're you see the good in people and maybe think that you're able to help them where no one is willing to help them. Do you, do you think maybe that's something? Yeah. I mean, a hundred percent. That's exactly what it is. I mean, I've not been a perfect human being by any means, but I know that once people get addicted to opiates and heroin specifically, you know, and that's something that's just been around my family, man, like crazy. They tend to do things that maybe they wouldn't normally do had they not been on that. So when people come to me and say that that's what they think about me, part of me believes it in a way only because it's surprising for I'm sure even you to hear that. It's just because unintentionally I'm doing it. You know, I think I'm helping them, but if it keeps them around a bad environment and the comedy business is that we're always in bars, it's always at night. You know, fans literally give. You know, fans literally give Artie Lang drugs, man. They 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 sneak backstage. If I, we have a security guard attached to Artie, or somebody watching him, you got to be careful. That guy's not doing drugs and letting the people in and giving him the drugs. You know, there's so many variables around it, and there's so many stories I know about Artie and his friends, and I don't want to really out them too too much. But you know, the the gist of it is is that if Artie couldn't find his drugs, you know, he would just go back home. If we were in Connecticut or Long Island, and, and, and I, not that I've seen him look for him, but he would just go home. I would get in these hotel rooms, and he would go there. And maybe I remember one time after a Connecticut show, I had already a hotel, and we followed him there to make sure he got in okay. And then me and my friends were just smoking a blunt of weed in the parking lot, just relaxing after the show. It was a big success. And we see Artie come out 10 minutes later, and his driver brings him back to his house in New Jersey. I ended up texting his driver. And so my buddy goes, you know, let me go up and uh, it was Andre Kim. He goes, let me go up and check out the hotel. I, I, I might as well sleep here so I don't have to drive an hour away. And he called me when he was in the hotel and he said the pillows were just all over the place. As if Artie just went in there and jumped on the bed and was just happy as hell that he had a good show. And just maybe wanted to live the experience that he used on the road. I don't know. But then he realized he didn't have any drugs. I wasn't getting them for him. And he got in the car back wherever he is, and he drove all the way back to Hoboken. So he would do that, and, and you know, I think the only thing I'd be guilty of is making the man money at a time where he, you know, he, that's the only thing he's going to use it on is drugs. And I, I began to see that, you know, as, as you start to work with him, but you're blinded as well by, you know, this is a guy that I love to listen to growing up. This is a guy I don't want to see her. I want to keep him on stage because I know as a comedian – there have been times in my life where I was very down or out and depressed and just getting on stage and letting it out uh, would be big for me. It would be therapeutic, whether you're at an AA meeting or you're at a regular comedy show. Uh, but I, I didn't see at the time that when you're a celebrity, man, it's a whole different ball game. You know what I mean? Um, so, you know, it's I'm not denying what you're saying. Of course, you know, I don't want to see them getting high and ruining their lives and hurting themselves. Um you know, but at the same time, a lot of a lot of the time, you're not even thinking about that. You're just blinded by, you know, your own greed and your own, you know, want to be success. And uh, that's a, it's a tough thing to deal with, man. And I think that now that I'm out of it, I think to myself, yeah, I want to help people, but I don't think I'm in any position to help them if they don't want to help themselves. So I am definitely not a person going into this saying. I can cure Artie Lang's addiction. You know what I mean? Um, I, I just think that I was real with him. You know, I would tell him to his face what I thought. Uh, and he would listen to me and the same with Bam. So I know that when I'm in person with these guys past their addiction, I don't talk to them like an addict. So there are people out there who will talk to Artie Lang every day and say, we hope you get better, Art. We hope you get better. We hope you're good. And, 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 you know, of course he wants to get that support, but part of him wants to feel normal. And that's the only way that somebody's even going to gain sobriety. If they're constantly badgered about their sobriety, it's going to cause them to stress out and slip. Um, so I wouldn't really talk to him about his sobriety. I would just tell him he's better than what he's doing. 
and I would tell him about Jimmy Barone dying from heroin. That's how I would relate to Artie. I would always tell him stories about Sandler and working on the set with Jimmy and how he would, how he died and how he would do with this heroin and how it's so bad. And Artie would just constantly tell me, tell me, tell me he's not doing heroin. It's only, you know, cocaine that he's doing. And, uh, you know, again, I don't really have as much experience with that, but it still could kill you. And I would tell him that, you know, and, you know, I would try to convince him that, you know, if he, if he stops doing it, the doctor could fix his nose and, and, uh, all this stuff, but he wasn't ready, man. He wasn't ready till the judge told him he had to be ready. And even then he wasn't ready. You know, something kind of also wondering, you know, with working with some of the people that you have, having a, a comedy, you know, spot of your own to kind of bring people through, had any, like, up-and-coming com- comedians kind of hit you up to kind of manage them? And, and were you kind of looking more – because, I mean, it's interesting that, you know, you are a comedian yourself, but it seems that you have kind of a knack for for doing, you know, the booking side of things and more of the business side of things. So it's kind of one of yeah, those that – I mean, I've done that for a while, but certainly when, you know, Nomads is a business built by comedians for comedians. So other comedians had invested their money into this with me as well. So when you start to say to your troops, you know, I'd worked with all local comedians for close to 10 years and helped them out as much as I could. I wouldn't really say I managed any of them, but I just would, would put on as many shows as I could and, and help them as much as I could. And, and the thing about it is, when, you know, when they're investing their own money into a project because they believe in it just as much as me as these, these big celebrities are going to draw, na- you know, numbers and whatnot. And we don't have to sell tickets on the boardwalk or they don't have to make just minimum dollars because that's the thing is that comedians get paid worse than minimum wage. Most of the time, I tried to create a business where we could, you know, put our own money in and, and uh, you know, yeah, collective type thing. So when these guys blindside you with cancellation after cancellation, you get screwed you know, you lose a bunch of money and then you slowly start to pay it back. But some people lose faith and patience and, you know, so I've really been run through the ringer through this whole thing. And I don't want to just, I don't want to just deflect all the responsibility on these celebrities. I think that a lot of it has to do with my decision-making and not being a sound enough adult to say, you know, okay, maybe there's a chance they could fuck me over. Um, the one thing I didn't do with any of the big names I worked with was sign a contract, which most people would say I'm the, I'm the, the stupidest guy in the world for not making them sign a contract. But it seems to me that these guys were working with me because I wasn't forcing them to do that. Uh, it seemed like every time I tried to bring up some logistics or anything, these guys would just, it's almost like they knew they could use me for a wild ride, you know? And it was just like something that if I had brought that up, it, it would probably would have shut the whole thing down because that's what they get from other people. And when they cancel on Foxwoods, you know, that might have them under contract, they're liable to get sued for that. Just like I am now for putting my name on some of these BAM shows. So it's a mistake that I definitely made. And it's something I'll have to live with and, 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 and probably even pay the debt myself. But as a 28 year old kid, who's, who's been through more than just this, I'm certainly not the one to let it destroy or define me. I have to stand up for myself and speak my mind and my beliefs of my business as if they're su- I'm a success. So I, I can't give up on my beliefs just because the guys didn't show up to the shows because the shows that I did do, you know, they worked out financially. It just sucks that I, I basically it's been a huge gamble. And that's what I don't want the people who have invested to understand even if you're a, a guy who owns a venue that put up money for one of these guys or you're myself or my best friend, who's one of my biggest investors, or a comedian that helped us pay for something along the way. Whether we've had a fallout or not, I am the kind of guy to pay it off because I want to feel as though that I overcame this. And whether it takes three weeks or a year, you know, I'm going to do that. Whether Bam, Artie, TJ helped me out or not. Um, I have to. I have to for myself and my family. Did what you went through with Artie make you trepidatious in wanting to work with Bam in light of all that he had going on, not only just with himself personally, but just, you know, who he is and how the Jackass crew kind of is <laughs> just around each other? And I guess not. it's not a lack of care, but it's just like a you're sort of at their expense. They're so different. Artie wasn't really like that. He would be so apologetic every time. He would kind of make you believe it. It's his, it's his addiction, and it's true. So with Bam, it's tough because Artie, you know, is just like one guy, and Bam has like an entire army around him um, at all times. So it's just two different animals. Bam is somebody that I just watched with Jackass growing up. And I always thought he was a funny dude. And I thought that, you know, 
even now it's very funny with the way he texts me sometimes and his his ways of going about things his mind is so unique and um it just built originally i was going to go out there just to do the show in detroit and see meet them and see what it was like and then um his manager kind of grabbed a hold of me as far as what he'd been promising and um and whatnot and you know i have text messages and everything to prove what my innocence it's just that in court that i don't know i have really talked to the lawyers that's you know going to save my ass or not because i didn't have these guys sign contracts so the answer to the question is no it didn't deter me from working with bam i knew that bam was going to be a crazier situation i felt as though after working with you know jimmy and tj and Artie that i could handle bam and uh be mistaken on that one you know you kind of explained how how you were able to work with tj you explained how you you know were able to to get to work with Artie for a little bit how did you end up on that detroit show because i mean someone from the east coast it just seems kind of i mean obviously i know bam is from the east coast but it just seems weird that two east coast guys <laughs> come all the way to detroit to do a show there's a young comedian who uh, my young i mean who's new in the comedy business who had contacted me and we were working together on shows for quite a bit and he told me when Bam had his first party in December that he was going and I couldn't make it. I had a show that night. So I basically said to him, yeah, man, like ask Bam if he wants to do something and we'll put it together. Now this gentleman that ended up going down, his name's Mike. And when he got to the party, he, he did his due diligence and he got in front of Bam and his manager and everybody. But supposedly he ended up giving his business card, not mine. And when Jack Bam's manager called Mike, Mike is just very new to the business. And he basically just said, you know, Hey, does Bam want to open for me on a comedy show? And Jack, his manager kind of laughed him <laughs> off. And, you know, he kind of laughed him off. And then before the phone hung up, he goes, no, 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 no. You want to call this kid Vinny? He works with Ark and blah, blah, blah. You know, you want to call this kid Vinny? You want to call this kid Vinny? So Jack called me and on the phone, me and Jack had gotten along for a while. And he explained to me his Comic-Con business and how he does it. And I explained to him about the comedy business and how it works. And we talked for five weeks through my Artie shit, and he had just said, once Artie went to jail, he just said, oh my God, I wish you can come to Detroit. We have this show, and we don't know what the hell we are doing. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, we have all these tickets sold, and Bam's never done a live show before, so we were just going to do a Q&A, but we don't have anybody to moderate the questions. It'd be great if you can come. So at the time, the kid Mike that I had sent to Bam's show had invested about $1,000 into the Nomad's business. And I said, Mike, you know, to pay you back for that money, um, me and my wife will fund the entire trip to Detroit with hotels and food and car rental and all this different stuff. And, uh, you know, of course, the Comic-Con tickets and you know what I mean? Like just the whole weekend. And we'll go out to Detroit and I'll even throw the kid Mike, you know, a few minutes, five minutes on the show to introduce me. And, and, and that'll kind of pay him back for introducing me to BAM as well, you know. Um, so we went out and we went to Detroit and that's where I met you in the lobby of the hotel. And, uh, that was it. just checked in our room. We went to the Comic-Con. It's the first con I've ever been to. I, I actually think that they can use regular stand-up comedy in the times that they don't have those Q and A's with the celebrities for people to watch. And I've actually talked to the guys at Astronomicon about that and they seem very interested. So what I'm hoping through all of this is that possibly Don Veltman from, the Michigan shows that we canceled with Bam will possibly want to maybe team up and do something at the con, you know, and that'll help alleviate some of the pressure of uh, working together. And then maybe, you know, Bam or no Bam in the future, that could work out. So that's something we can talk to him about, hopefully, if, uh, if all the cards align. But I just feel as though entertainment there was awesome. The con was very fun. It just would have been cool if the, if the people walking around had more options to go sit down and watch something, you know. Um, and so that, that's where I think comedy would come into play, but you know, I'm walking around the con and Mike's there and, and whatnot. And I just walked right up to Bam when he was at his table and I said, Hey dude, I'm the comedian that drove from Connecticut to come and help you with the show. And he really respected that. And, and, you know, we talked for a few minutes and, you know, then he got really busy and I, I just left him alone. I wasn't like a super fan that wanted to just cling on to him. And that was like, you know, part one. And then I talked to Jack in person and Jack was super busy and said, Hey man, get to the venue tonight, which is the shelter below St. Andrews Hall in, in Detroit. You know, that's where they base the movie eight mile off of. And, and there's going to be, you know, 400 people and get there early and do a walkthrough and blah, blah, blah. Well, we get there 
there's already about 200 people waiting in line outside in the freezing cold. This is in the middle of February. And Bam's inside already with Jack when I get there. I mean, they must have got there long before I did. So I walk in the back and I say, hey, Bam, we're just chatting for a few minutes about Artie and chatting about him and what do you think going on? And he's just really nervous. And that's when I first see Jack be like, you know, we got to get Bam a drink. We got to get Bam a drink. And I didn't know anything about Bam's addiction or anything at that point. Uh, I just, you know, figured the guy needs to loosen up or something. I don't know. I mean, he was completely normal when I met him, you know. Um, and so I just, yeah, I talked to Jack for five weeks, drove out to Detroit, got into that situation. So I'd kind of known already that that Jack was doing, Jack was claiming that he was just putting water in the drinks. But you know, when you seen Bam by the end of the night, you knew that that wasn't the case. So, um, and so I'm on, I'm on stage and I tell Bam, like, we're going to start this thing. And, and they have 400 people just standing, no chairs, live nation produced the show. And I asked them how much they made off of it. And, and it seemed with all the tickets that were sold that they kept about 80% of the ticket sales to Live Nation and only 20% to BAM. But nobody's there besides BAM. And, and they don't know what they're doing, really. And I don't know what I'm doing. And I just tell BAM, you know, look, I have failed a lot in this business. I'm not afraid to fail. So I'll fail. Let's go. Ship's going down tonight. We're doing it, you know. And so he giggled a little bit. And uh, I, I basically said to him, Look, I said, I'll go out. I'll introduce Mike for a few minutes. If uh, they don't like him, I'll try to bring the crowd up. And, and if uh, if you like the way, that, you know, the crowd's responding to me, then just come out. We'll introduce you and you come out, you know, and, and then we'll just bullshit for a little bit. And so he seemed okay with that. And that doesn't really seem like much of a plan. It seems like anybody could do that plan. But <laughs> obviously, coming from Connecticut, nobody had that idea just to wing it, you know. I was like, all right, we're going to wing it. And uh, Mike, I brought out Mike, the comedian, and, and uh, i got to be honest with you, it's just awful, you know, but I had, I had really wanted to pay him back for, you know, uh, introducing me to Bam, and I didn't want him to say Vinny, you know, is a dirtbag and went without me or whatever. So I gave him, a, I only gave him three minutes on stage, and, you know, the crowd is just 400, you know, young people and old people and black people and white people and it's just Detroit man it's just rough there's people from all over the country that are coming to this thing and to see BAM and uh so I get out there and I tell a couple corny jokes the same kind of corny shit I say on stage and they're laughing and it was feeling like in well on video it looks a little different but in person it feels like the people were having some fun with me and I only did a few minutes brought out BAM it's on YouTube you can check it out the whole thing and it was it was not pretty you know it was, it, I didn't know anything about him besides that he had been in Jackass and being in the band and beat to the dead. And the shit everybody knows, you know. Uh, I hadn't been following him like a normal fan, so I'm reading this paper off the ground asking these questions, and, and he's answering them, but, you know, I would kind of say some bullshit afterwards, and he, he would laugh, and the crowd would kind of laugh, and, and, you know, so we got through it, you know. And after, after we got through it, I said to this dude, We'll, we'll meet again somewhere and we'll talk about if this is a possibility to, to do this for real. Cause this was just a mess, you know, but the, the real story lies with what happens afterwards, which is his manager, Jack, who look, man, we were kind of like in this love hate relationship where like, we really en enjoyed joking with each other and kind of like helping each other figure out tough situations. But he sold me down the river a hundred times. I've sold him down the river a hundred times because there's just no trust with a guy like him. He, he, every time he talks to me about somebody he's worked with in the past, it's always about how this guy has backstabbed him and stole a client or this guy's backstabbed him and stole a client. And I'm like, dude, I want to be a comedian and a producer of the shows. You could be his manager and deal with what underwear he's wearing. I don't care about that. I just want to do what I do. But he didn't get that. He kept thinking I was trying to take Bam's job or something. But As you pointed out on online, that's his only client. So... <laughs> Well, no, he's just, and, and we'll get into that. It was just a joke. He's really got all these clients, but he's got a website that doesn't have it. Jack's got a website. If you guys are listening, go to PriorityAppearances.com and take a look at this Comic-Con booking website. And when you go to it, he's got all these celebrities on there that, you know, he's not getting consistent work for. So it, I would love for you guys to go comment, you know, to these celebrities that are on his website and see if they really work for him or not. Cause his name, his information, his number, none, none of it's on the website, you know, and that should be red flag number one, you know, but he introduced me to Bam, So that's the biggest one that was on his website. And I think that's the only real big fish he has, you know, 
And so, like, when you think that, you think, oh, well, if he had, damn sure he has Mr. Belding from Saved by the Bell. You know what I mean? You, you start to think, like, oh, this guy's a straight shooter. But, you know, I'm an idiot. And that's what people from Comptown know about. Everybody knows I'm an idiot. Uh, so I believe the guy. And, you know, Jack is, like, this guy that kept thinking, you know, maybe going to take his job. But we we go backwards a little bit to the, the Detroit event. Afterwards, Bam's like, come on, man. We're going to make, you know, 10 grand if we go to the strip club. And, and all these strippers want us to be there. And, you know, Bam's like, I don't want to go to the strip club. He's like, I don't want to go there. And he's a little bit drunk. And he's signing autographs, signing autographs, signing autographs, signing autographs, signing autographs. No, no, no infrastructure or break. Just 150 people online. And Bam's got to take pictures and sign autographs on all of them after doing the show. And now it's just seeming like too much work. And he goes outside and fans are following him outside. And there's no organization. There's no security helping him. There's just chaos in the street as Bam's just ha- trying to have a cigarette. And, you know, I'm trying to talk to him, but he's getting irritated. So I just leave him alone. And Jack's trying to drag him in the strip club next door. And Bam's just refusing to go. So I just tell Bam if he doesn't want to go, that we will just get him his driver to bring him back to the hotel. And that's what he decided to do. So that was the first time Jack got pissed at me. But I was sitting there going like, well, if you're trying to drag him into this place he doesn't want to be, I'm not going to make him go through that, you know. So I don't. We get him a ride back to his hotel. A few, maybe an hour and a half later, I'm at my hotel. And I get a call from Jack that Bam is missing and they don't know where he is. And all this other bullshit. So I go back to his hotel and kind of find out Bam was just in his hotel room listening to really loud music and they kicked him out. And he was listening to extremely loud music, you know, and and they kicked him out of there. So he's, it's 3 a.m. He's not in his hotel. We're in Detroit. And I immediately think he's at a strip club of some kind because that's really the only place that's going to be open at that time, you know? And he just doesn't know where to go. He got kicked out of his hotel. And he had been getting fed drinks all night from Jack, thinking that he needs it to perform live in front of these people when he really doesn't. He has all the talent in one pinky that's more than all of us in the entire room. So he doesn't need that. He needs to be told by his manager that he can do it sober and that it'll be a lot more fun and he'll remember more stories and it'll just be good. And if he's nervous and he fucks up, who cares? We don't have to do them anymore. You understand? Like, that's the exact conversation that Jack should have had with him. But no, Jack was feeding him drinks. So Bam is drunk. And I go ahead and call a strip club at 3 o'clock in the morning. I found one on Google. And a guy picks up the phone as it's, it's, if it's 3 in the afternoon. And he's like, hello, strip club, Detroit. You know, and I'm like, hi, do you have Bam Margera from Jackass in there? And the guy goes, yes, we do. We're holding him here for you guys holding him as if he's some caged animal i guess bam was just <laughs> i guess at that point he was just kind of going crazy and a little rowdy you know and so at that point jack begs me and my girl to pick him up we pick him up we go to the strip club i walk in jack with the strip club and there's like there's the strippers just sitting around nobody's dancing they're in their sweatpants at the end of the night you know you got a guy counting the money at the bar you got two other big bouncers just kind of watching bam as he's sitting on a chair twirling around like a kid and, uh, you know, at that point, he just holds Jack down and punches him in the nuts. And not a lot of people know that, but he made the bouncers hold him down and he hammered Bam's balls. I'm mean, sorry, he hammered Jack's balls, Bam did. And I just remember thinking, I don't know if I'm built for this, you know? <laughs> like, I was just like, I don't know if I'm ready to fight Bam at three in the morning, you know? And after that, Jack takes, like, a fistful of money out of his pocket that was, like, $300 and just gives it to me. And he's like, you'll make more. You'll make more. You know, uh, you got to work with us. Keep working with us. Because, you know, he he realized that he could potentially have scared me away at that point. And they didn't pay me a dollar up until that point anyway. So I was like, all right, I got some gas money to go home. And I see that they need me, you know. Like, you can tell they need a team. They can't – he can't do it alone, Jack, you know. He, he, Bam is doing these comic cons where he's there for three days at a time. So of course he's going to drink, man. These comedy shows, if they're done well, he takes a flight in. It's two hours. He gets on a plane afterwards and goes straight home. That's the schedule that I wanted him on. And you know, that, that would have worked out. But even when it was two or three nights in a row, take him back to the hotel, make sure he's not drinking, make sure that he's not around alcohol. And you know what? Bam's a big boy. If he wanted the alcohol, he could probably go get it himself, but don't put it in his hands. And that's just kind of how I feel, and I feel passionate about it because 
after that, uh, Jack told me, listen, Vinny, if you want to do this with Bam, you're going to have to drive to his house and talk to him. And I said, does he know I'm coming? And Jack was like, yeah. And then when I got there, nobody at the gate had heard about me ever, and they didn't know I was coming. So he made me drive five hours to Pennsylvania, not even knowing if Bam was going to be home or not. Thank God Bam was working on the skate ramp. I go on the property. I walk in there. And, you know, Bam's sober as ever, just working on the thing. And he's just like, hey, man, how are you? And that was when I seen a different side of Bam. You know, immediately that day, we went out to lunch. I had another comedian with me. His name's Rodney. And Rodney ended up paying for the lunch before the bill got to us, which was really cool of Rodney to do. And we just bonded with Bam and talked about how Live Nation gave him a bad deal and how we can produce these shows under Nomad's name and how we can do this. And Bam agreed and he was totally with it. And um, we were kind of off to the races. And I spent a lot of time at Bam's castle that whole month just trying to learn about Bam. We were filming some promo stuff. I was reading all of his stories and jokes and poetry and art and all this stuff. And he's got a music studio and he skates every day and he just was the most talented person I ever met. Uh, and the only thing that, that gets bad about him is when he is on some substances of some kind. But the only time I really ever seen him getting trashed is when he's under Jack's supervision. And it was just something that I couldn't really handle. And it led to way worse things afterwards. So, you know, but when Bam was not like that, which 90% of the time when I'm with him, he was normal. Uh, he was constantly teaching me how to deal with negativity on the internet. He was constantly teaching me about how drama works and why people want to view things and why they don't. Um, and he just taught me a lot. And I do have a lot to thank for him for that. But it doesn't alleviate the fact that there are fans out there who feel neglected and cheated of money. And it also hurts the fact that he's outed me to two million people that don't know what to believe about me. And most of them believe the wrong thing. And I don't have all the money in the world to fix his problems, you know. Well, I think uh, this is a good stopping point for, for part one. Uh, and if you okay. are willing to come back uh, soon, maybe we can uh, kind of pick up from basically Detroit and on. Um, you and I kind of weave in and out of each other's uh, narratives a little bit at this point, a little more from the Detroit date. Uh, I will say to kind of put a cap on your, your, your strip club night, I do remember seeing you over our hotel breakfast the next morning in your, your PJs. <laughs> And I was like, oh, because like you and I were supposed to do a podcast that night, actually. Uh, you had actually graciously invited my wife and I to the show, and it was just too far away for us to, since we already had the hotel, to drive all the way, like the 45 minutes into Detroit proper, go to this show, which, I mean, admittedly, since we had already seen the Fuckface Unstoppable stuff and uh, have stories from that, it was just kind of like, no, I have a feeling that's going to be a shit show, so we're just going to stay here. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I don't so blame me was... at all. So it was one of those things that uh, I saw you the next morning and I was just like, oh, how was your night? And you're like, oh, whew. Uh, I have to tell you about it sometime. So it's it's uh, yeah, apropos it's that, you know, that here we, we are, you know, almost uh, half a year later, uh, finally getting to, to have the conversation. And it's uh, been pretty interesting so far. But I think, uh, you know, for a lot of people, you know, you were on the Lone Shark podcast. You kind of talked a little bit about more of, of what's to come. But I think, you know, there's – there's been other developments kind of going on and, you know, with me having a hand in working with you uh, on booking, you know, three Michigan shows and so forth. I can kind of explain from my perspective uh, how things went. Uh, perhaps maybe we can have Don uh, come on and, and kind of talk about, you know, some things potentially or, or whatever after, you know, we put yeah, this Yeah, I would out. love that. I would absolutely love that for sure. He's been nothing but amazing so far through this process, so. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, uh, you know, we'll, we'll reconvene and kind of pick this back up uh, for a part two. And, uh, yeah, so thanks for, you know, coming on and talking uh, so far about what you have. Where can people find you uh, to keep up with what you're going on and, and kind of keep up with some of these things in, in real time if they would like to? Uh, Instagram is the best way, at Vinny Beetle, V-I-N-N-Y-B-E-D-L-E. And just come check out my Instagram and, and take a look at the stuff I've been posting about Jack. And, and, you know, I have an upcoming appearance on the Come Town Radio podcast, which is more of a – basically belittling of me but you know it's got a big audience and hopefully we could get some viewership from that and yeah so that's that's where they could find me or they could uh call my phone i really keep my phone line open to anybody people call me crazy for that but because of such a david versus goliath situation with bam's instagram following of two million versus mine i like to keep my phone open for anybody to call and pretty much say whatever they want or talk to me about whatever so 
that's the easiest way to reach me by text or call. And uh, I don't know, it doesn't get more real than that. Absolutely. Well, thank you again for taking the time, and uh, we'll be in contact and talk again very soon. Thank you, man.